Hello, darlings. I thought, considering the year that we've all had, I would take the time to read to you a childhood favorite. My mom read this to us several times over the years. The best Christmas pageant ever. And it really is. It's pretty great. And Mags wants to read it with me. So we're going to do chapter one tonight. All right. The Best Christmas Pageant Ever by Barbara Robinson. <laughs> Wherever you like, Max. Illustrated by Judith Gwynne Brown. Poor Jack, of course. Chapter one. The Herdmans were absolutely the worst kids in the history of the world. They lied and stole and smoked cigars, even the girls and talked dirty and hit little kids and cussed their teachers and took the name of the Lord in vain and set fire to Fred Shoemaker's old broken down tool house. The tool house burned right down to the ground and I think that surprised the herdmans. They set fire to things all the time, but that was the first time they managed to burn down a whole building. I guess it was an accident. I don't suppose they woke up that morning and said to one another, let's go burn down Fred Shoemaker's tool house. But maybe they did. I mean, after all, it was a Saturday and not much going on. Let me show you the pictures, because that's half of the fun. It was a terrific fire. Two engines and two police cars and all the volunteer firemen and five dozen donuts sent up from the tasty, tasty, tasty lunch diner. The donuts were supposed to be for the firemen, but by the time they got the fire out, the donuts were all gone. The herdmans got them. What they couldn't eat, they stuffed in their pockets and down the front of their shirts. You could actually see the donuts all around Ollie Herdman's middle. I couldn't understand why the herdmans were hanging around the scene of their crime. Everybody knew the whole thing was their fault, and you'd think they'd have the brains to get out of sight. One fireman even collared Claude Herman and said, did you kids start this fire, smoking cigars in that tool house? But Claude just said, we weren't smoking cigars. And they weren't. They were playing with Leroy Herdman's young Einstein chemistry set, which he stole from the hardware store. And that's how they started the fire. Leroy said so. We mixed all the little powders together, he said, and poured lighter fluid around on them and set fire to the lighter fluid. We wanted to see if the chemistry set was any good. Any other kid, even a mean kid, would have been a bit worried if he stole $4.95 worth of something and then burned down a building with it. But Leroy was just mad because the chemistry set got burned up along with everything else before he had a chance to make one or two bombs. The fire chief got us all together. There were, there were 15 or 20 kids standing around watching the fire and gave us a little talk about playing with matches and gasoline and dangerous things like that. I don't say that's what happened here, he told us. I don't know what happened here, but that could have been it, and you see the result. So let this be a good lesson to you, boys and girls. Of course, it was a great lesson to the Herdmans. They learned that wherever there's a fire, there will be free donuts sooner or later. I guess things would have been different if they'd burned down, say, the second Presbyterian church instead of the tool house, but the tool house was about to fall down anyway. All the neighbors had pestered Mr. Shoemaker to do something about it because it looked so awful and was sure to bring rats. So everyone said the fire was a blessing in disguise and even Mr. Shoemaker said it was a relief. My father said it was the only good thing the Herdmans ever did and if they'd known it was a good thing, they wouldn't have done it at all. They would have set fire to something else or somebody. They were just so all around awful you could hardly believe they were real. Ralph, Imogen, Leroy, Cla Claude, Ollie, and Gladys. Six skinny, stringy haired kids all alike except for being different sizes and having different black and blue places where they'd clonked each other. They lived over a garage at the bottom of Sproul Hill. Nobody used the garage anymore, but the Herdmans used to bang the door up and down just as fast as they could and try to squish one another. That was their idea of a game. Where other people had grass in their front yard, the Herdmans had rocks. And where other people had hydrangea bushes, the Herdmans had poison ivy. There was also a sign in the yard that said, Beware of the cat. 
New kids always laughed about that till they got a look at the cat. It was the meanest looking animal I ever saw. It had one short leg and a broken tail and one missing eye, and the mailman wouldn't deliver anything to the herdmans because of it. I don't think it's a regular cat at all, the mailman told my father. I think those kids went up in the hills and caught themselves a bobcat. Oh, I don't think you can tame a wild bobcat, my father said. I'm sure you can't, said the mailman. They'd never try to tame it. They'd just try to make it wilder than it was to begin with. If that was their plan, it worked. The cat would attack anything it could see out of its one eye. One day, Claude Herdmond emptied the whole first grade in three minutes flat when he took the cat to show and tell. He didn't feed it for two days, so it was already mad, and then he carried it to the school in a box. And when he opened the box, the cat shot out right straight up in the air. It came down on the top of Blackboard Ledge, of the Blackboard Ledge, and clawed four big long scratches all the way down the blackboard. Then it just tore around all over the place, scratching little kids and shedding fur and scattering books and papers everywhere. The teacher, Mrs. Brandle, yelled for everybody to run out in the hall, and she pulled a coat over her head and grabbed a broom and tried to corner the cat. But of course she couldn't see with the coat over her head. So she just ran up and down the aisles hollering, here kitty, and smacking the broom down wherever the cat hissed back. She knocked over the happy family dollhouse with a globe of the world and broke the aquarium full of 20 gallons of water and about 65 goldfish. All the time she kept yelling for Claude to come and catch his cat, but Claude had gone out in the hall with the rest of the class. Later, when Miss Brandle was slapping band-aids on everybody who could show her any blood, she asked Claude why in the world he didn't come and get his cat under control. You told us to go in the hall, Claude said just as if he were the ordinary kind of first grader who did whatever teachers said to do. The cat settled down a little bit once it got something to eat, most of the goldfish, and Ramona Brillian's two pet mice she brought for show and tell. Ramona cried and carried on so. I can't even bury them, she said. She carried on so much they sent her home. The room was a wreck, broken glass and papers and books and puddles of water and dead goldfish everywhere. Miss Brandle was sort of a wreck too, and most of the first graders were hysterical, so somebody took them outdoors and let them have recess for the rest of the day. Claude took the cat home, and after that there was a rule that you couldn't bring anything alive for show and tell. The herdmans moved from grade to grade through the Woodrow Wilson School like those South American fish that strip your bones clean in three minutes flat, which was just about what they did to one, e one teacher after another. But they never, never got, pet got <laughs> they never, never got kept back in a grade. When it came time for Claude Herdman to pass to the second grade, he did not know his ABCs, or his numbers, or his colors, or his shapes, or his three bears, or how to get along with anybody. But Miss Brandle passed him anyway. For one thing, she knew she had, she'd have Holly, oh my gosh, she'd have Ollie Herdman the next year. That was the thing about the Herdmans. There was always another one coming along, and no teacher was crazy enough to let herself in for two of them at once. I always was in the same grade with Imogen Herdman, and what I did was stay out of her way. It wasn't easy to stay out of her way. You couldn't do it if you were very pretty or very ugly or very smart or very dumb or had anything unusual about you, like red hair or double joints. But if you were sort of a medium kid like me and kept your mouth shut when the teacher said, who can name all 50 states, you had a pretty good chance to stay clear of Imogen. As far as anyone could tell, Imogen was just like the rest of the Herdmans. She never learned anything except dirty words and secrets about everybody. Twice a year we had to go to the health room to get weighed and measured, and Imogen always managed to find out exactly what everybody weighed. Sometimes she'd hang around, waiting for the nurse, Miss Hempful, to give her a band-aid. Sometimes she'd sneak behind the curtain where they kept a folding cot and just stay there the whole time with one eye on the scales. Why are you still here, Imogen? Miss Hempful asked one day. You can go back to your room. I think you better look and see if I've got what Ollie has. What does Ollie have? Imogen shrugged. We don't know. Red spots all over. Miss Hempful looked at her. What did the doctor say? 
We didn't have a doctor, Imogen, began scrunching her back up and down against the medicine cabinet. Well, does Ollie have a fever? Is he in bed? No, he's in the first grade. Right now? Miss Himple stared. Why, he shouldn't be school in school with red spots. It could be measles or chicken pox or any number of things, contagious things. What are you doing? Scratching my back, Imogen said. Boy, do I itch. The rest of you boys and girls go back to your classroom, Miss Hempel said, and Imogen, you stay right here. So we all went back to our room and Miss Hempel went to the first grade to look at Ollie, and Imogen stayed in the health room and copied down everybody's weight from Miss Hempel's records. Your weight was supposed to be a big secret, like what you got on your report card. It's nobody's business what you get on your report card, all the teachers said, and Miss Hempel said the same thing. It's nobody's business what you weigh, not even the fat kids could find out what they weighed, but Imogen always knew. And here's where we're gonna skip a little bit because this was written in the 70s and apparently they were mean about your weight. So we're just gonna not read that. Uh, for a while, she got 10 cents a week from Floyd Brush until Floyd caught the double pneumonia, <laughs> until Floyd caught double pneumonia and lost 15 pounds and didn't care anymore. My friend Alice Wendelkin was so nasty clean that she had detergent hands by the time she was four years old. Just the same, Alice picked up a case of head lice when she was at summer camp, and somehow Imogen found out about that. She would sneak up on Alice at recess and holler, Cooties! and smack Alice's head. She nearly knocked Alice cross-eyed before one of the teachers saw her and took them both to the principal. Now what is this all about, the principal wanted to know, but Alice wouldn't say. I had to hit her, Imogen told him. She's got cooties and I saw one crawling in her hair and I don't want them on me. You did not see one, Alice said. I don't have them anymore. What do you mean you don't have them any more, the principal said. Did you have them lately? It really shook him up. He didn't want a whole school full of kids with cooties. So he sent Alice to, to the health room and the nurse went all through her head with a fine tooth comb and a magnifying glass and finally said it was all right. But it was too late. Everybody called Alice cooties the whole rest of the year. If Imogen didn't know a secret about a person, she would make one up. She would watch you and catch you in the girl's room or out in the hall and whisper, I know what you did. And then you'd go crazy trying to figure out what it was you did that Imogen knew about. It was no good trying to get secrets on the Herdmans. Everybody already knew about the awful things they did. You couldn't even tease them about their parents or holler, your father's in jail, because they didn't care. Actually, they didn't even know what their father was or where he was or anything about him because when Gladys was two years old, he climbed on a railroad train and disappeared. Nobody blamed him. Now and then you'd see Mrs. Herdman walking the cat on a length of chain around the block, but she worked double shifts at the shoe factory and wasn't home much. My mother's friend, Miss Phillips, was a social service worker, and she tried to get some welfare money for the Herdmans, so Mrs. Herdman could just work one shift and spend more time with her kids. But Mrs. Herdman wouldn't do it. She liked the work, she said. It's not the work, Miss Phillips told my mother, and it's not the money. It's just that she'd rather be at the shoe factory than shut up at home with those, that crowd of kids, she sighed. I can't say I blame her. So the Herdmans pretty much looked after themselves. Ralph looked after Imogen, and Imogen looked after Leroy, and Leroy looked after Claude, and so on down the line. The Herdmans were like most big families. The big ones taught the little ones everything they knew, and the proof of that was that the meanest Herdman of all was Gladys, the youngest. We figured they were headed straight for hell by way of the state penitentiary until they got themselves mixed up with the church and my mother and our Christmas pageant. And that is the end of chapter one.